history of band Skid Row. Skid Row, one of my favourite bands of all time. Seriously, absolutely top draw. Absolutely love them. So I'm really looking forward to giving you this very brief and quick rundown of their amazing and eventful career. So, where they come from? They are from Tom's River, New Jersey, in the United States of America. Uh, a lot of big musicians come out of New Jersey. Um, Bruce Springsteen, the Gaslight Anthem come from there. Anthrax come from uh, around there, New York, it's not the same place. Um, and obviously Bon Jovi and Skid Row. Um, in fact, Skid Row and Bon Jovi um, actually know each other. We'll get into that in a minute. So, the band was formed by uh, Richard Boland and Dave the Snake Sabo um, in 1986. Now, prior to this, uh, Dave the Snake was actually in a band with Mr. John Bon Jovi. They were actually childhood friends. Um, they made a pact. They were one of them little childhood packs, you, you know. Um, said if one of us gets to the top first becomes a rock star first we'll come straight back and get the other one um and did snakes actually john bon jovi's original guitar player back in the day so um you can actually hear him play on the first record uh if you listen to this lead single of that which is runaway i believe um that's all day the snake um and you can you can hear that sort of skid row tone in that guitar uh, it's really cool Go and sell it up top of here. Um, yeah, so after that first album, uh, Richie Sambora came in, um, and as the story goes, Richie Sambora walked up to Mr. John Bon Jovi uh, at a gig and said, I'm going to be your new guitar player, and John Bon Jovi went, all right, and, and pretty much chinned his best mate off, um, and I had, to, I had Richie Sambora. There you go. So. There we are, 1986, the band is formed um, through various different uh, outlets, they've got newspapers, all that sort of stuff to advertise for members. Sell on a five piece um, with Scotty Hill on guitar and um, Rob on drums and a sort of fella on vocals. Uh, they started gigging around, um, Bon Jovi hits it big, they signed a um, management contract with Dr. Gay and they get a major live deal and consequently they become at the time the biggest selling pop metal band on the planet hands down and uh, due to a really good piece of um, marketing so jump jump back into this John Bondrovi comes back for his, for his mucker he comes back for Dave the Snake Goes to his management company, Doc McGee goes, you have to sign this band um, and get them a record deal. So Doc McGee at the time is um, one of the biggest, most influential managers in the United States at the time. He's not only taking care of Bon Jovi, but he's looking after Motley Crue and um, he looks after Guns N' Roses over on the West Coast. So the rumour goes that he's actually looking for a band as a counterbalance to Bon Jovi's softer side um, so that, you know, he can basically have the same thing but on each course. Um, so he gets a tape of um, Skid Row, likes what he hears, however, he says he's not going to do anything with them until they get a new vocalist. So he signs them and he just shelves them. Um, Let's the band know and says, if you go out and get a new vocalist um, who is at an acceptable level, then we'll take you off, we'll get you signed and go do the biz. So they fire the guy and they th think that the turnaround is not going to be too long and it turned into a 12 month search for a singer. So both the band and the management company are looking for a singer. And lo and behold, a tape arrives on the desk of Dr. McGee of Sebastian Bach. And he hears about this. Apparently, there's this uh, six foot blonde haired lunatic who's got an amazing voice. Puts the tape on, likes what he hears, um, sends it out to Skid Row, says, This is the guy, Skid Row. 
like up here and send up demos with 18 alive and I believe you've got wilds on there as well um, and Sebastian Bach himself really loves tunes they're flying down and uh, they go for a jam in the basement everything comes off absolutely spiffingly and they go out and get leathered and get into a big massive bar fight as you do but they've got their main man that they need so they then go record the self-titled debut album um, which is absolutely banging it's got some great tunes on there it's got uh, You've Gone Wild, Big Guns Sweet Little Sister and uh, obviously 18 and Life you know uh, banging album go record that goes five times platinum and they end up going out on uh, three tours with they go out with Bon Jovi obviously uh, they go out with Motley Crue and they go out with Aerosmith as well so during this time during the Aerosmith punk tour a couple of notable, noticeable instances happen um, the infamous bottle incident where someone decided it would be an amazing idea to shoot to chuck a bottle at Sebastian Bach while he's playing. He got the picked up the bottle, rather agitated by the whole thing, and zeroed in on who he thought it was, chucked the bottle back, and missed by a country mile and hit Alas instead. Which enraged him even more, so he decided to then jump down in the crowd start a riot and start smacking people and he's giving it all stopping back on my elbows everything's going well but nobody knows if we got the right guy but um yeah started a riot caused us a chaos and yeah that didn't really sit too well following on from that he then went on stage with a t-shirt with the logo aids kills fags dead Yeah, not exactly the best idea in the world. Um, yeah, he uh, <laughs> he said it was a joke. It's not really very funny. In an interview, he did let say that he understands people's point of view. Um, after thinking about it, he said if someone had worn a T-shirt that said "Cancer kills grandmas," he'd have been pretty pissed off. Um, yeah, so the fan gave it to him, he didn't read it, it's just something that he'd always just chucked on and didn't notice what was on it. Uh, Apologised numerous occasions for it, but it was still, it got them a lot of negative press. So, took a little bit of time out and then they wrote their second album and recorded it and released it, which is Slave to the Grind. Released in 1990, and this is an absolutely banging album. This is the album that Skid Row essentially helped create a new subgenre of music called sleaze metal. Although they came out in the in the in the era of like pop and glam metal, um, they are seen by a lot of people as the proprietors of sleaze metal. This is the album that they really encapsulated that whole vibe and feel with. Uh, it's, it's like Slave to the Grind On, which obviously it's absolute banging tunes, unreal. Um, riot acts, get the fuck out. You know, it's an absolutely insanely good album. Takes elements of like of metal and thrash with the hard rock stuff and the hookiness and everything that I had on the previous album. Put it all together, a big massive cauldron. <laughs> Slave to the Grind On. Yeah class album you absolutely have to check out if you don't like this style of music you're probably going to like it but it's amazing you need to pin your ears back and listen to that bad boy um, they went out toured everywhere with it they even took Pantera out on uh, on a tour of the United States as their support which shows how heavy this album really was um, it still took to it still stuck slightly to that format it had a couple of uh, ballads in but those ballads are very well written and they've got Sebastian Bach singing on them who's arguably one of the greatest singers of all time so they're, they're not too shabby really um, yeah so they went out and they, they played they played Donington Monsters of Rock I think they went out on tour with Motley Crue as well um, 
It was it was a really really good landmark album for them. Um, they went out for about two years, went everywhere, brilliant. And there was no major incidents on that tour, apart from grunge that came along. So grunge, what happens? What happens with this? So the management company uh, and their manager, Don McGee, um, decide along with the band and kind of talk the band into taking an extended break. Um, because grunge is coming. So during the time that Skid Row were out on tour with Slave to the Grind, oblivious to everything that's going on, uh, grunge is hit and it's hit big in massively. And um, what Skid Row have got is nowhere near what um, grunge is and what is current and popular at that point in time. So um, they take the advice of the management company, they take a little bit of time out, and then they come back with Subhuman Race uh, three years later in 1995. That is released. And it's not a bad album, actually. It's quite a, quite a dark album. They shifted producer as well. Um, Bob Rock did this one. It's very, very well produced. It's a good album. There's some really good tunes on there. Eileen's a really good tune. I like that one. As a side note, they don't really play any of these tunes live. There's maybe one um, which they play live. But, anyways, so they come back with this album and they realise that they've been totally and utterly dropped by MTV and by radio. They can't get any any video play, they can't get any radio play. Um, and back in, back in 1995, you needed that. If you were going to sell records, you needed radio player and MTV. That's what you needed. And they weren't getting any. They were not interested. Um, they went out and booked a big tour, which didn't sell out, and they had to downsize to smaller venues. So they weren't playing noticeably smaller venues at this point as well, um, which must have been a bit of a kick in the balls, to be honest. Um, and... Consequently, in 1996, with all of this happening, it led to the break with the band. So the band were offered a support slot with KISS on their reunion tour, one of the many reunion tours of KISS. And it was a big deal for Sebastian Bach, predominantly. If you were to go and have a conversation with Sebastian Bach and ask him, what or who God is, he would more than likely, nine times out of ten, turn around to you and go, Kiss. So Sebastian Bach was more than on board with going out and supporting Kiss, his idols, essentially. Um, however, the rest of the band weren't so keen on the idea. Um, retrospectively, looking back on it, it would have been a really good business move for them as well. Um, they were playing smaller venues, um, the crowds weren't, the, the, the venues weren't selling out, they weren't making money on the, on, on, on the record sales, they weren't making merch sales. Um, if they had gone out and done this, uh, this support to a whip kiss, they could have made bank, to be honest, and they could have raised the profile of that album um, and actually probably saved it, to be fair. But they didn't want to do it. Um, some of the band members felt that Skid Row at that point in time was not a support band and was a headlining band. Um, some of the band members were just not interested and didn't want to do the band anymore. Um, somewhere in the middle, in the grey area, is where the truth is. But no one will actually ever find out. So the band broke up and they went off and David Snake and Rachel and Scott Hill went off and did this punk rock sort of band playing at really, really small venues, like talking like bars and pubs. Um, and Sebastian Bach moved out to LA and, and had an amazing solo career. Uh, um, Rob, the uh, the drummer, went off and did lots of different bits of session work, I believe. Um, 
Everything was all good. Everything was all gravy. Um, however, uh, the lads in the band, uh, Rachel and uh, Scotty and David Snake, started getting a bit frustrated and yearned to play to more than a slack handful of people in a bar. So, in 19, around 1998, the band decided to reform um, and get Skid Row back on a go. However, they didn't want to do it with Sebastian back. And Rob, the drummer, didn't want to do it without Sebastian back because it wouldn't be Skid Row. That was his stance. Um, so the three remaining rep, the three remaining members um, got one of their old mates, play drums, and put the call out for a singer. And they found Johnny Soninger. I think that's how you pronounce his name. So the band returned to live gigging with new vocalist Johnny. And ironically, they are supporting Kiss, one of their very many farewell tours. Um, and they released uh, Thick Skin in 2003 and Revelations Per Minute in 2006. Now, poor old Johnny gets a bad crack of the whip here. He does. Because, for the simple fact, he's not Sebastian Bach. Um, the albums that they did with him, in my opinion, are not actually that bad. The, the first one they did with him, Thick Skin, I, I actually think is really, really good. It's got some banging tunes in it, it really, really does. He's not Sebastian Bach. He doesn't have the same range as Sebastian Bach. He can do falsetto stuff, but there's more singers and then there's Sebastian Bach in his range and there's few people that have that. Um, it worked for the band for what they wanted to do. They changed the style slightly. They became definitely more of a hard rock band with metal sort of uh, tinges to it. Um, the Revelations per minute album was more of, it sounds more like the band's just having fun. They're just throwing different styles in and different sorts of genres coming together. It just sounds like a fun album. It sounds like, sounds like they have real fun just writing it, just not being bothered at all. Uh, and then in 2013, they decided to do a trilogy of EPs titled United World Rebellion. Um, that only turned into two EPs as they fired Johnny, poor old Johnny, in 2015. Um, he had a good run in Skid Row. Um, as I said, I liked him. As a, as a vocalist, I, I saw them live when they came over to UK. Um, it was brilliant live, it was really good live. Um, and I like, I, I genuinely like the answer. And it's, it's a shame that most of the Skid, Skid Row fans and most music critics really wouldn't sign off on Skid Row specifically because the tunes didn't have Sebastian Bach singing them. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a funny old man, really, isn't it? But poor old Johnny, he basically got penalised for not being Sebastian back. What are you gonna do, um, Johnny? I liked you. That's the most important thing. There we go. Uh, the band then promptly replaced him with uh, former TNT vocalist Tony Harnell. This is weird how this all happened and how it all came about. Um, Johnny released a statement saying he quit. Skid Row then immediately released a statement saying, nah, he's been fired, and then immediately hired uh, Tony White. So um, they'd been jamming with Tony a couple of months prior to that. So yeah, I don't really, don't really know what happened there. Um, but old, uh, old Tony, only lasted eight months or nine months, something like that. He was gone. By the, by the end of the year, uh, he quit. Musical differences, and then Dead Snake summed it up best on paper. It looked like a real good match. However, in practice, not so much. Take that, take from that what you will. And then, they then replaced him with ZP from Dragon Force. 
uh, as their current vocalist and I'm now going to finish the United World Rebellion trilogy but they're not going to do an EP, they're going to do an album which was supposed to be released in, in 2019 and we're still waiting for it um, yeah, so there you go, there is your brief history on Skid Row so what do you like, do you like Skid Row? do you only like Sebastian Bach's uh, stuff? I don't know. Do you like Johnny? Were you one of those people that would not let Johnny have a fair crack of the whip because he wasn't because he wasn't Sebastian back? Were you one of those people? Hmm. You should be ashamed. Naughty. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's what you think. And we'll see you in the next one in the next brief history of. Okay.